This video will feature side mission gameplay from Pandora and Promethea, and it won't feature any story spoilers. Hey guys, so just over a week ago, 2K sent me a review copy of Borderlands 3. I have been playing it pretty much non-stop over the last week or so. Today the embargo lifted, so we can talk about a bit of the game at least before launch. And at the time of recording this, I have 75 hours in the game. So three of the last 10 days of my life has been me playing Borderlands. Now, I didn't want to spoil anything or talk about the story or what you should be doing, but instead wanted to give my advice on who you should be playing out of flat. Black, Zane, Murs, and Amara. This video will purely be done from a gameplay perspective, so we're not really going to be talking about the story, the backstory, interactions, favourite voice acting, or who can rock the Marcus Bobble hat the best. Instead, we'll be basing it off the following. What makes them unique? Their abilities? styles of play, like in other games, the pros and cons, a brief look at the talent trees, what they're like at late game, solo versus co-op, why you should play them, why shouldn't you play them. One thing that I did want to mention first, one of the keywords for this game is options. There's no Mordecai from Borderlands 1 where you can only play that character in one or two ways, with a sniper, with a revolver, everything else just isn't as good. All of the characters are incredibly versatile and flexible in this game. They are all incredibly strong DPS wise, in the right hands with the right builds, and all of them are very fun. If you're set on playing a specific Vault Hunter, then I don't intend to change your mind. I do however want to let you know what you're in for when the game launches and what you should be expecting. If you want to be helpful for some of the indecisive people that may come to this video, comment below on who you'll be playing and why. Let's go over the most popular Vault Hunter out of all of them, at least going off early polls. That being Flak. What makes Flak unique? The main thing is that you have a choice of free pets that will accompany you in your missions. You will also be able to choose free abilities that you can mix and match with the skill trees that you invest into, your playstyle, and of course the pets that you're running. The first ability is Rack Attack, where you send forward two racks to dive bomb enemies. You have two charges with an 18 second cooldown, meaning that you can fire this out fairly frequently. You then a fade away, which is similar to Zero's ability in Borderlands 2. Flat cloaks turn in invisible and flat can fire three shots whilst cloaked. Each shot is automatically a critical hit. You also gain increased movement speed and health regeneration when you do this. And finally Gamma Burst, where you create a rift at the target location. Your pet teleports through the rift, dealing radiation damage to nearby enemies. The pet also becomes irradiated, growing in size and dealing bonus radiation damage when it attacks. You can also use it to revive your pet although it does increase the cooldown from 30 seconds to 60. If you're not familiar with Borderlands 3 in any way, you also have augments in the skill tree which can improve or change the abilities quite drastically. For example, for Rack Attack, you can have it have multiple charges. You can change the Fire Axe to do ice damage, and you can also get them to give you health whenever they do damage too. So I'm not going to go over all of these, otherwise we'll be here all day, but we will have a flak video going out later this week, really breaking down these skill trees and how good they are just as an FYI for the rest of this video. But now let's go over the pets. In the Hunter Tree, you have the Spider Ant, which whilst it's out, it has a passive of giving you some health regeneration on a per second basis. You have the Jabber Sidekick, which runs around and shoots stuff with a gun, which is obviously great, but it also increases your movement speed by 5% whilst it's out. Finally, you have the Skag, which increases all of your damage by 5%, and is quite a tanky pet in comparison to the other ones. Much like abilities, you can augment each of these pets to make them stronger, to do more, and just become more powerful. We have another video going over the specific pets that Flak does have. There's nine in total. So if you want to check that out, it's at the top of your screen. What kind of styles of play can you expect when you play Flak? Well, if you're looking at previous Borderlands games, which I'm going to use here, Mordecai and Zero are very close with how they can play as snipers. The also fade away abilities, or at least Zero does. We can also play them in close quarters, revolver, roguey, swashbuckling play styles. Because of that, it also compares very closely to the World of Warcraft character archetypes, such as the rogue, because obviously you can stealth and fight close quarters, a hunter, because you have a pet and you can focus a lot of your talents and skills into that, and you also snipe from a distance. Now let's quickly go over some of the pros and cons for Flak. As I said, if you have any questions, I'll answer them a bit more in depth in another video, but we have to go over everybody. I don't want this video to be like an hour long. The first pro is you get a pet. What's cooler than that? Even if you're playing on your own, you always have a buddy riding alongside you, which I think is great. Like I mentioned, each of the pets grant you passives, 
that you can improve with specific talents, making them even stronger. All three of Flak's abilities are strong in very different areas, meaning that Flak is a very flexible Vault Hunter in their playstyles. You could play them as a sniper, a rogue, or invest in heavily into your pets, whatever you fancy. You can also evolve your pets to make them stronger, which is an added bonus. You also get two augments on your abilities, meaning that you can make those abilities even more flexible by giving them health regen, changing the element, increasing the amount of charges. There's so much you could do there, and all of the options are valid in lots of different ways. Flak absolutely rocks with any form of sharpshooting weapon, sniper rifles, revolvers, any Jacob's weapon basically that does a lot of damage if you can hit those headshots or critical hits. Because Flak has a lot of talents based around increasing gun damage or critical hit damage, it means that you do the most when it comes to those situations, which makes Flak incredible in boss battles where the boss is like massive for example but has a lot of critical hit points where it might be a lot more difficult to hit them with let's say demolition mows because it's all based around explosions every form of flak can make that work you also have a nice mix of ability duration you can have the high impact but long cooldown gamma burst to instant use additional charges of rack attacks if you want a big ability like an ultimate to use you could do that or just something added extra to constantly throw out with your damage but one of my favorite things from leveling up is that when you get a new shiny legendary a lot of the other vault hunters are like oh this is cool but i can't really use this in my build because it doesn't go with what i'm trying to do flat can make any of the legendary guns that they get work especially legendary jacob's weapons like i've been getting recently he loves playing with them that's for sure but there are a few drawbacks with playing flak the first is that they're not very flexible with elements at all in playstyle they have a few options but not as many as say zane or amara elements are an important factor of the game especially going up against enemies with shields or armor that's where flak could fall behind a little bit with dps because he just isn't as flexible as some of the other vault hunters pets whilst they are a nice addition can be absolutely useless in situations such as a big boss fight they will literally sit there and do nothing because they can't fight certain bosses can't really go into more detail without spoiling stuff but you'll You'll see what I mean when you play. Unless you spec into certain trees, they could be a massive glass cannon or at least very immobile alongside. Meaning that no matter what you do, there's going to be an element of flex playstyle that will be a big weakness. Whilst I said that flat can make legendary weapons work, if you have bad weapons, especially early game, it can suck for flak in a lot of different ways especially if you're lacking high damage weapons. Because of all of this focus on getting critical hit shots, if your aim is a bit rough, it might be difficult to get the most out of them. Flax capstones aren't majorly exciting, they're okay, but they're not as high impact as some of the other Vault Hunters, meaning that you don't have that amazing ability to chase. And finally, anointed gear, at least the ones that I've seen for Flak, do seem rubbish in comparison. Just some of the weapons and shields that were coming up just didn't add much, but we can talk about that some other time, really. Now let's quickly go over each of Flak's skill trees. The first is Hunter, and this is all about gun and crit damage. It's about hitting hard with every single shot or ability that you have. Because you have Rack Attack, you have your ability up all of the time, with one of the shortest cooldowns in the game. You could also get some nice health regen, or burst health regen, from the rack augment every time they do damage you get health back which is nice it's also a really good ranged ability for some fights and you do have elemental options but it's all about using a sniper or at least a weapon from distance making sure that enemies aren't fighting you to increase your damage and then you just headshotting everything or at least getting critical hits in which do a ton of damage the only drawback here really is that the pet can be really useless because you don't spec into them at all so your spider ant will just die a lot and it gets kind of annoying to keep picking them up. You have the Stalker, which is more the high movement rogue play style. You fade away where you could just, you know, stealth, run around and stuff. But you can also increase your mobility past that, both in and out of fade away. You get good health regen just on the bounce, quicker cooldowns and a damage increase too. And it pairs well with all forms of weapon types. Running with a sniper or a shotgun all works, all based around survivability and mobility. The pets again feel like they don't really add much in this tree. It dies less than the spider ant, as the jabber is often at range because they're firing a gun as opposed to just standing at them in the face. You have very little elemental option, and if you're getting hit hard by, say, a boss, you can be very brittle. And finally, we have the master tree, where the pet becomes more useful, actually much better than most people are giving it credit for. You and your pet can survive and deal decent damage, but it is the weakest DPS-wise than the other two skill trees. 
The Gamma Burst ability is cool, but it has a very long cooldown in comparison to the others. You can augment it though for survivability and damage, which means that you can make a nice support build for Flak by using some of this stuff. The Capstone again is, nah, it, it's fine. How does Flak fare at endgame? I can't say too much on this yet due to me not being level 50 and me putting in the least time on Flak in comparison to the other ones, but it definitely feels that Flak is one of the ones that gets much stronger as they progress. The damage they do per shot is easy easily the highest across characters. As you complete one of the skill trees by reaching level 32 or whatever it is, and you can start specking into other skill trees, it's a great way to cover up some of those pitfalls that you may have. If you're dying too much, invest more into the master tree. If you want a bit more mobility, put points into stalker. Want to increase that damage as a whole, go hunter. The only issue is, like I said, the anointed gear I've seen on Flak does look a bit underpowered, but that's only from the stuff that Earl sells. Maybe when you go to endgame content, some more rarer and stronger stuff may show up. How does Flak fare in solo co-op gameplay? He is really good solo, because you always have a friend with you that's got your back. Co-op is also fantastic due to him being an all-out DPS character, being more of a rogue looking after himself, but also having support abilities with high regen, like the Gamma Burst Augment that we spoke about, that creates a healing rift. They can do whatever you ask of them, and I think that's a really good thing to have, both playing on your own and also in a group. So, why should you play Flak? If you played Mordecai or Zero in previous games and want to continue that trend, you like having a pet, obviously, even though sometimes they don't really add much. You can't decide between having a pet heavy class, a sniper rifle user or a swashbuckling rogue. You like Pro ZD because his voice acting is tremendous. You want to dominate all forms of bosses. You want to play solo, but not play solo if you get me because of the pet. Or you want to support your team with mad health regen or just a lot of damage. And finally, play Flak if you want a defined playstyle, but you do want to switch it up now and again. You shouldn't play Flak if you don't want to play an aim centric hunter. Also, don't play Flak if you want to focus in different areas like melee or explosive because Flak doesn't have much to offer there. And finally, don't play Flak if you're bothered by everybody else basically wanting to play Flak at that point. I know you people exist, I'm definitely one of them. Next up, Zane. What makes them unique? The best thing about Zane is the fact that you can equip two abilities at once. You have three abilities total and you can mix and match whichever ones you want to run, each of them having two arguments, meaning that there's dozens of viable build options that you can run. If you're indecisive about who you want to play and how you want to play it, then Zane is a really good option. There's no defined roles for him, but that honestly might be a good thing for a lot of players. He's definitely the rogue archetype for BL3. I know I said that about Flak, but Zane is also the high mobility kind of character. If I was to compare him to other games, he has a Tracer in Overwatch vibe, but mostly Scout from TF2, just run into people with a shotgun right in the nose, bang. He also plays very similarly to Lilith in Borderlands 1, and of course Gage with him summoning a Sentinel and also a Digiclone. We mentioned the abilities, let's go over them now. The first of which is Digiclone, where you spawn a Digiclone of Zane. The clone stays in a place but distracts and fires at enemies. When you press this ability button again, Zane and the clone switch places, and you could augment this to do explosive cryo damage to regen your shields as you do it. There's a lot of stuff you can do there. Not to mention you can make the clone incredibly strong with the doubled agent tree. We'll talk about that a little shortly. Next up is the Sentinel, where it sends into battle an automated Sentinel, which is immortal. It cannot be killed, I don't think at least. It flies for the air and attacks enemies with its machine guns. You can add different weapons, rockets and stuff. It hits harder, it's the most offensive option, but it has a longer cooldown than digital clone. And finally Barrier deploys a deployable shield that blocks incoming projectiles. You can plop it on the ground or pick it up, but as you shoot through the barrier it deals increased gun damage, really short cooldown in comparison to the others, but like I said, you can equip two of the three that I've just mentioned here. What are the pros and cons for playing Zane? You can make any weapon, manufacturer or elements work. He is definitely the most versatile, but like I said, everybody is versatile. Zane is just really good for a first playthrough, I think, once you get to know how everything works. All of the skill trees can provide damage and can cater to playstyles. He is the best hybrid character. He's not overly reliant on his cornerstones because they're not great. So he can make mix and match builds, even hybrid between all three of the builds if he wanted to. There's a lot you could do with him. 
You can play him as a fast and agile DPS, like a scout with TF2 as I mentioned, or more of a slow assassin with the Digiclone. Because of this, you can play him into really good boss battles, keeping yourself alive and doing decent damage, but not as much as, say, Flak. And you've always got a friend alongside you with the Sentinel or Digiclone. The cons are that he is very undefined in comparison to the other ones, which might be quite frustrating. Even 30 hours into playing him, I'm not sure what specs the best and what to go for. Which might be good for a lot of people that want to experiment with him, but there's definitely a lot of hidden depth to this character in comparison to others. You don't get to use your grenade mod unless you spec into certain talents that have your Digiclone throw a grenade or your Sentinel throw a grenade. Otherwise, it's useless really. The cornerstones, as I mentioned, are fine, but they're not incredibly amazing if I'm honest. You can struggle with ammo regen in comparison to some of the other Vault Hunters, and you can definitely hit a ceiling without the right gear or talents. Zane in Proving Grounds, as an example, can be really rough with the wrong builds. In a lot of situations, he deals less damage in comparison to others, at least from my experimentation. He was the character that I played first and played the most of, he's level 46 in this gameplay, but I'm still not really sure. I'm left scratching my head on how to play him and how to go about him. There is a good thing though, I do have some really cool anointed gear for him. For example, when I activate the barrier, my shields instantly start recharging, making it a really good ability in a dicey situation and it's just a lot of bits and pieces like that so i think that he is very dependable on having the best augmented gear in order to do the most but you have a lot to play with there if you want to make a crazy build out of nothing zane is the character for you Let's go over the skill trees in a little bit of detail. The first is Doubled Agent. This has a lot of focus on your Digiclone and also a good amount of survivability with decent damage. It's great for burst phases of bosses. It's all about using both your abilities at once and having your DPS increase as a whole because of that. The talents for increasing damage are very early in the tree, which makes it great for any form of hybrid builds. It's a great leveling tree, probably the best if I'm honest. He's decent against all boss encounters and good cooldown reduction for using any abilities that you want to. It feels like when you use heroism in World of Warcraft, it's that kind of vibe when you use your abilities that you have that burst damage, that high DPS rotation, I suppose. But of course, the drawback to that is when you don't have your abilities ready and they're off cooldown, it means you don't do as much damage. You can be quite dependent on them. You don't have any actual health regen. It's more about keeping your shields up. But I guess one of the biggest weaknesses is that your Digiclone can die in comparison to the Sentinel, which means in some boss battles, you place it down, it gets one shot, it's dead. That's it. But it's a nice welcome distraction you could use to clone to taunt the enemies away so you can, you know, be left alone, not taking any form of damage. And you could also spec it in a way that it actually does a hell of a lot of damage overall. So you can do that if you want to. Next up is Hitman. This is all about kill skills and keeping those kill skills up consistently. It increases multiple stats, the damage that you do, your fire rate, your reload speed. It's really good for those high movement moments, such as leveling, certain boss battles, and proving grounds. And it's not overly reliant on the skills that you're running. The Sentinel, unlike the Digiclone, doesn't die. It can stay alive. And it also tends to do more damage than a Digiclone without the skill points needed for it. It has a longer duration than the Digiclone, but also a much longer cooldown. Because it's so reliant on kill skills, it kind of sucks in group play. But if you're not killing targets, you're not doing a lot which means that if you come up against a boss or a certain badass mob that's hard to kill and you start losing those kill skills, you're going to struggle to keep yourself alive, to do damage, all of it. But there's also little survivability. But once you get going, it's really strong, but you can slow down to an absolute halt if you're not careful. It's just things to concentrate on, I guess. And finally, Undercover, this is a trait that often gets overlooked. This is my favourite. It makes him very hard to kill, actually gives him decent damage in comparison to the other ones, and it complements all of the other skill trees. If you want to invest into Hitman or Doubled Agent, you can pair this up nicely with Undercover as a whole. It's also great for the Zane Ice build that a lot of people have been using. I can tell you for certain it is really cool. And there's offensive and defensive options for the barrier. The capstone in this trait is just rubbish if you're not playing in a group, and you don't have any talents that make use of your grenades, which means it'd be pointless for leveling. But I would say that this tree becomes fundamental for higher tier stuff, and it's also just a lot of fun. But like I said, I was level 46 on Zane at the time of recording this. How is he as we go into endgame? I tried to improving grounds on Zane, but I struggled in comparison to say Amara. It'll take a while to theorycraft the best builds and rely on getting the best anointed gear or legendaries, but I feel once you have the pieces in place, he is going to be one of the strongest in all 
things that you do at Endgame. But if you want to go into it saying, oh, I want to play a melee character or an explosive character, there's a lot better Vault Hunters for that kind of stuff. So if you're not really asked about playing a specific style, Zayn might be one of the best. Because as you start picking up gear, you can go, oh, I can make Zayn a melee character with all of these bits and pieces. But because of that, it makes it really easy to underestimate him. It wouldn't surprise me if in two weeks time, there's a crazy Zayn build that somebody's made that's just near and unstoppable by everyone. How about solo versus co-op? Well, the undercover tree really does complement any form of co-op playstyle. Not in a sort of Nurse Maya way that you just become the healer, but you can add offensive, defensive options. It just means that Zayn is going to be a nice addition to a team no matter what. For solo play, he's also really good. I think he's great for a first playthrough if you still haven't decided. Might be new to Borderlands. I think Zane is the best shout, honestly. He can do everything, but he's not amazing at anything in particular. It's kind of the jack of all trades, master of none. I know that's not the full quote, but that's kind of how he feels. Why should you play Zane? If you want a character that can cater to you specifically, that you want a fluid, flexible playstyle that isn't as defined as the other characters, but that means you can do more with it. You want more abilities to play with, more options, more survivability, more damage. You want to be good at everything. You love balancing abilities, your procs, your elements, and your guns for pure chaos. There's no set rotation for Zane, making every fight and every engagement supremely unique and it's a lot of fun doing that. Don't play Zane if you want somebody more defined like a melee sniper, tank character. Whilst Zane can do all of these to a certain level, there are much better options in each of those areas. Don't use Zane if you want to use grenades. And don't use Zane if you want high impact capstones for more ridiculous things that you could do. Zane just doesn't have them. I don't want to put you off if you do want to play him, but like I said, he's the one that's leaving me scratching my head a little bit more. But once you get to end game and you start farming builds and stuff, this is where he's really going to sort of kick into gear. But I did want to mention he is really good for leveling too. Let's talk about Moe's. What makes Moe's unique? Well, she's the gunner of Borderlands. Her playstyle has a focus on being unlimited ammo, big explosive damage, or just been an absolute nightmare to kill with her shield heal and damage to boot. And of course you have a big mech that you can enter and use. It's a long cooldown with a fairly short duration depending on how you spec into it, but it can provide a huge amount of utility as well as of course damage. Most are six gun types, but in each of the trees at the top you can only pick three. The first is the rail gun in the shield of retribution tree, which fires an electrified high velocity projectile that deals shock damage. In the bottom of mags tree you have the miniguns, which is capable of sustained rapid fire, firing for long periods causing a minigun to overheat and in the Demolition Woman tree, you have the Grenade Launcher. As you spec into each of these trees, you unlock three different weapons, but we'll talk about that some other time. There is another video going over that too, in case you wanted to see it. What kind of playstyle can you expect from playing Moe's? Well, very much the gunner classes of previous games, Roland, Axton especially, Salvador with just the regen of ammo that you have that could be crazy, and in other games, of course, Diva, Titanfall, that stuff springs to mind. And also Mr. Tog, because you can do a good amount of explosive damage. Man, that build is ridiculous. But the general pros and cons of playing Moe's. The main one is that you have high DPS in all of your trees, no matter what you focus on. Each of them are in specific areas, but they're all very strong DPS wise. Because of this, it means that you are great for boss battles or badass fights, and the ability to use your mech in those engagements too. It's also great for boss battles and badass fights. Turns it into a Pacific Rim kind of approach. And two guns on your mech, which I failed to mention beforehand, you can mix and match whatever weapons that you want, which gives you a lot of flexibility using your ability. Because the main drawback, of course, when we go to a cons, is that you can only use the mech. You don't have any other abilities. You can change it with the guns like I mentioned, but that's all you can do, realistically. Her mobility is the worst in the game. Her mobility sucks, so in a lot of those situations where you need to move and do damage, she can struggle. She does have certain talents that can keep her firing while she's sprinting, but she doesn't have the same crazy movement speed as the other three. Her mech is on a long cooldown, no matter what skill tree you go into, and no matter how you spec it, it's still long regardless. And whilst you're waiting for the iron mech to come off cooldown, you will be super weak against certain badasses and bosses, which make certain fights quite stressful. Moe's for me is like a warrior in World of Warcraft. Very strong, perhaps the strongest DPS character in the game, but you are very reliant on the gear. Not only guns, 
guns, but also shields and class modes. Once you get the right stuff though, you will blast through enemies, but you are very dependent on the gear that you have. If you don't have good stuff, it's gonna suck. You are not very flexible with elements when you're playing Moe's in comparison to Amara or Zane, and you only have one augment for each gun, which kind of restricts you on stuff that you might want to be able to do. We'll go over the talent trees now, let's go over bottomless mags first, which is really straightforward. It's all about regen in ammo as you fire, making it so you don't really need to reload. We of course saw gameplay with the Butcher from Gamescom doing the Proving Grounds, which is ridiculous as we highlighted before. But I also did it recently with a high mag gun, like I'm showing you on screen. This is a Vladov Legendary. And you can see how long it takes for me to actually get this gun to reload just firing at the sky. It makes it really good for boss battles where you can just hit a crit point over and over and over again. It means that you can mow down bosses fairly quickly, but you don't have much to stop damage coming through at you. And you don't have amazing amounts of regen, which make it a bit of a glass cannon in comparison to some of the other Moe's builds. It's pure DPS, but the Iron Bay use is good, the cooldown is relatively short, and you also do just as much damage in the mech as out of it. It's a very straightforward tree though, so if you're not interested in having a gun that constantly fires and doesn't need to reload, there's not really much else in that tree that's for you. Shield of Retribution is another tree. This is one that again gets overlooked because it's all about being tanky. The pros are of course that it's very high survivability because you have a good amount of shield recharge, but also you do a lot of damage, which is a thing that I often see overlooked. The Iron Bear weapons are good for long and short range, but you don't really have much to reduce the ability cooldown for using the Iron Bear mech. Also, you don't have any talents that reduce the fuel that's used when using Iron Bear. It means that you have to wait a long time for it, and then you're in it for 10 seconds at most, which makes it pretty bad. But when you are in Iron Bear, it does a lot of damage. So it's really good for burst phases, I guess. It's the most balanced playstyle. It doesn't focus too much on having regen in ammo or explosive damage like the other two trees. It has really good synergy with a good shield, but if you don't have a good shield, like I said before, it can really suck. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for leveling, until you get past like level 30 or so. And finally, Demolition Woman. This is a really fun skill tree. It has low cooldown and a long duration with Iron Bear, meaning that you can use it the most. It's amazing close quarters. It's not overly reliant on elements because you just blow everything up anyway. It's great at mobbing, badass fights and bosses, both in the mech and without, and it is just ridiculous with the right gear. The issue is that it sucks at range because you're not really accurate with having explosive weapons. That's what the tree's all based around, is just doing as much explosive damage with, let's say, Torg weapons and also grenades. So if you want to be accurate, you just miss out completely. But it is also very reliant on having a good explosive gun and also good grenades. If you don't have that, again, it sucks. And much like bottomless mags, it does shoehorn you in into a particular playstyle. So if you don't want to do explosive damage, again, not really for you. What's Mer's like endgame? She was the slowest to level. I think she's the one that's going to suck at the earliest levels. But as you get to a point where you can start really using the skill trees and what they can do, she's one of the best as you get up to like level 30 and beyond. She's great against tough badasses where others may struggle. I've not tried on improving grounds just yet, but I feel like she'd do really well. She just might not be the fastest. She's very strong in each of her skill trees, no matter what you want to do. None of them stand out for being better over others when it comes to DPS. It just depends on what gear you have and what you want to do. She's very much the one that starts off slow, but going into Ultra Vault Hunter mode and Mayhem modes, that's where she's going to rock it, I think. Solo versus co-op. Solo, she struggled. Like I said, leveling her. And in co-op, she doesn't really provide much for the rest of her team, other than her teammate being able to jump on the back of a mech, which is cool, but that's that's really all it is. I wouldn't say don't bring a Moe's into a group, but everybody should expect a Moe's in a group to just not really provide an awful lot for you. At least from what I can tell. So why should you play Moe's? If you want a big ass mech, for one. If you want a more defined playstyle, either being based around doing a lot of explosive damage, and I mean a lot, having a tanky character buff in and out of the mech, but with also very good DPS, or weapons that you never have to reload. Much like Flak, if you get a good legendary weapon, you can make it work so long as it fits under these areas that I've mentioned. But you definitely want to lead with the legendaries that you get. You get a nice Torg explosive weapon, you don't want to be running bottomless mags with it, if that makes sense. Don't play Moe's if you don't want to use a big ass mech. There's no other options really, so if you're not interested in that ability, don't play it. Don't play it if you want a faster character or playstyle, and don't play it if you feel that you're going to get frustrated by not having good guns with her, especially when leveling. 
She wasn't awful to level, I make it sound really bad, but she was the toughest out of the four. But I'm about to go into Ultra Vault Hunter mode with her, with a legendary Torg weapon, and I can already tell you that it's a lot of fun and she is incredibly strong. She also killed some of the final bosses in the game, in the campaign at least, in less than two minutes. So yeah, Buzz is very good. And finally, Amara. Honestly, I saved the best to last. What makes him unique? Well, she used the siren. There's a big elemental focus with plenty of abilities doing very different things. You can just flat out change whatever elements you're using, which makes it less reliant on the weapons, like Maliwan weapons. If you have a shotgun or a corrosive gun, you don't need to use that as much because Amara can just do that instead. The main thing is to not write her off as just a melee character. She is so much more than that. Let's go over the abilities. Face slam, you leap into the air and slam the ground, dealing damage to all nearby enemies and knocking them up into the air. You then have phase cast, sending forward an astral projection of herself, dealing damage to everybody in its path. And then phase grasp, which is basically Maya's ability from Borderlands 2. You CC them into the air, but it doesn't really deal any damage, at least not a lot. How does she compare to other characters in other games? Well, Borderlands 2, Maya, obviously. But there's also a hint of Hellborn Krieg in there and Mania Krieg if you want to go melee. Fist of the Elements is definitely the most underestimated skill tree out of everybody and it is so much fun to play, oh my god. But also in games like Destiny, there's a close affinity to a Warlock in there. That's probably the closest thing that I could compare it to. So what are Amara's pros and cons? The pros is that she has high sustain when spec'd properly. She's easily one of the most tankiest characters which means it's great if you just keep dying, you can play a character that's like her, but she can keep herself alive. She is amazing with elemental damage. It means again that you don't need to rely on elemental weapons to do jobs such as stripping shields or killing armor targets. Amara can just do it herself on the go as well. She is the melee queen. We'll talk about that tree a little bit more in a second because oh my god. She also has an incredibly diverse playstyle in what you could do, more so than anybody else I feel at this point. And considering we've gone over Flack and Zane and said the same thing, really says a lot about what Amara could do. All builds in each of her skill trees are a lot of fun and it only gets better as you get into endgame. There's a very fast playstyle in all of her builds and she's near on unstoppable when built right. Much like anything, she has her drawbacks. The first is that you can miss your abilities. With Zane with the Sentinel or Flak with Rack Attack as an example, you can't mess up those abilities. You use them and then they do stuff. Amara's the only one that you can use an ability, miss a target completely with a phase slam or a phase cast, and it will go on cooldown and you have to wait on it again. So that's very frustrating to play with. You of course only get one choice of ability at one time. You only get one augment, and you can change the element, but it just makes everything a little bit more awkward to move stuff around. Which makes her a little bit stop and start by going into the menu, switching to corrosive damage because an armor target has appeared out of nowhere. You kill him. Loads of guardians with shield health has turned up, so you need to go back to doing shock damage. That can be really irritating. But she can be tough against some bosses, especially those that don't spawn any adds to help her get up. Or to proc certain kill skills. Or just too big to punch. And much like Moe's, can be reliant on good gear, but not to the same extent. What about each of the skill trees? Let's go over Brawl first. This is one of the most fun ones that I've got to play. It's very defined, it's similar to Moses' skill trees where you kind of know what you're getting with it. If you want to play a melee character, then it's the best one. But if you don't want to play a melee character, there's not really too much that it can offer you, especially in the end tier. But it does have a lot of health regen and damage resistance, so it is useful even if you want to spec some points into it to keep yourself alive. But there is a bit of a reliance of your ability to proc certain things. The ability does suck against certain boss encounters because you can't reach them. Because it's melee focused, it's not very good at range. And it can struggle against big badass mobs. Basically anything that you can't one shot with your melee punches is where the Amara train starts to slow down a little bit. But once you get the right gear, abilities, legendaries, it's very fun to play if you want to play a melee character. If you don't, there's a few things that you can get in here, such as mobility and survivability, but it's a full skill tree that you're not really going to use, let's be honest. Next up is Mystical Assault. This one has a specific focus on a passive called Rush. When you invest into this tree, you gain stacks of Rush by either killing enemies 
or applying elemental effects, and each stack of rush increases your ability damage by a certain amount. So you build up these stacks, use your ability that does a lot of burst damage, more damage than anything else I think, you build up the stacks again, it's a nice ebb and flow if you're into that playstyle, almost reminds me of playing World of Warcraft in a lot of ways, because you have this really cool rotation. And there's obviously a big focus around her strongest ability, which is phase cast, which hits hard, is on a relatively short cooldown, and could also go through objects as well. It's a very balanced skill tree out of the others, which improves all bits of Amara's kit. The only real drawbacks is though, is reliance on having good elemental weapons or good weapons as a whole. It doesn't have much sustain other than the health augment, and I'd say it's just not as exciting as the other trees. It's a great ability for certain boss battles though, where you can't reach them, but if you're not killing stuff, and you're not applying elemental effects, you can't build up those stacks of rush, which means your ability just doesn't do too much damage. Like I said, we could go into more detail on each of these skill trees as we get further on into this week, but this video is already pretty long, let's face it. Fists of the Elements, the final tree that I wanted to go over, is honestly one of my favourites. It could do a lot of damage, and generally it's focused around taking non-elemental weapons, such as a nice strong Jacob Sniper rifle, and turning a portion of the damage that it does into elements, fire, electricity, or corrosive, which is great at turning a really strong non-elemental weapon into a strong elemental weapon. It's definitely the most flexible tree, and there's a nice low cooldown on the phase grasp ability, which is great at CCing tough enemies, or lining them up for some sniper shots, as an example. It very much reminds me of Hellborn Creek, because you can also get some health back from the elemental damage that you do, which means that you heal yourself a lot by doing a lot of damage, which I really like that playstyle of. Because of that, you have big survivability when you spec later into this tree. The problem is that there's very little survivability before that. The ability doesn't do much damage unless you augment or spec into it in a certain way. Because you have to do damage to recover from damage, it can be difficult in slower fights. The ability just doesn't work with some boss battles. You can't phase grasp somebody that's massive, as an example. And it can suck against certain immune targets to your elements. But it does take a while to ramp up skill-wise. What is she like at endgame now? Well, I'm struggling to pull myself away from the melee Amara build as you're seeing on screen. It's easily one of the most fun builds in the game, at least for me. Mystical Assault felt fine, it hits hard, but I'm not as excited for it as other trees, honestly. I'm just gonna have to give it more time and see what it's like really at endgame. But Fists of the Elements was much better than I expected, and I could definitely see an Amara Elemental Sniper build being very strong as you get up to level 50 and Mayhem modes in the future. What is she like solo versus co-op? Solo play is very lonely. No abilities or pets can help you. Group play having a tanky Amara or just an Amara that's on elemental duty will of course be very useful. But solo, it's a very lonely road. You don't have any pets. You don't have any abilities that can spawn and help you do damage. It's all on you and that can suck for a lot of people. So why should you play Amara? If you want to punch things, if you want to make full use of the elements and their effects, if you want a fairly unpopular character that is definitely going to surprise everybody at launch, or if you want to play a Siren. Don't play Amara if you don't want to punch things, or you want a pet or ability to help you. I definitely feel that people are underestimating Amara the most, and I can't wait for you guys to actually go in and play her. Not to mention playing everybody, that's the end of this video, it will probably be a very long one as I've edited this down, but I did want to go into explicit detail after I've played each and every one of them for three days straight, basically, on elements that people may not have expected to be problems when they get into game. Throughout this week, more content will be going out, I'll be going over each of them as I've played more time, going over the talent trees, what guns they're really good with, and also guides on leveling and things that you should really know before the game comes out. My voice is pretty hoarse at the end of all this, so I'm going to go. Thank you very much for watching till the end, and if you have any friends that aren't sure what to play, send them this video. Maybe they'll sit down and watch the whole thing, who knows. But take care, see you soon.